everyone. Greetings. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I'm Steve Dace. He's Todd Erzin. He is Aaron McIntyre. And she is Rachel Semmel. I literally just got an email yesterday. Bring Rachel Semmel back. Well, here she is from the Center for Renewing America. Now, you may notice, by the way, Rachel, congratulations are in order. You recently Thank tied you. the knot. So congratulations. Okay. I, I, we're all very, very happy for you. Anything you want to say about the, the extremely lucky gentleman or the event itself before we begin clawing at each other for the rest of the hour? No, he, uh, his name's Thomas. He's wonderful. I'm blessed that God put him in my life. And now uh, he and I, our efforts to uh, destroy woke and weaponized government have only been doubled by our union. So watch out, world. <laughs> there you go. You can even quadru- quadruple those efforts by, uh, by, by also procreating. Yeah, procreating, indeed. Yes, uh, you read my mind. So there you go. Congratulations again. Now, you. you may notice we might be accompanied today by an unintended orchestra. We're not sure what in the Sam Hill is going on. On. Some guy stopped me in Idaho last week. It said, I've, I haven't heard anybody since my great grandpa say, what is what in the Sam Hill? I said, yeah, trying to bring sexy back. Anyway, um, I, we don't know what in the Sam Hill is going on in the office building next door, which is a radio production company, ironically enough. Yeah. So normally they're pretty quiet over there. All right? So we're not sure if you guys can hear the drilling going on there or not. Stop the hammering. Yeah, Lawrence know. O'Donnell We'll called. do it live. <laughs> yes. But just in case, we wanted you to know it is not the fault of your receiver nor our signal. There is some commotion happening next door. So we just wanted to let you know about that. Also want to let you know about a brand new partner that we have here on the show. Had a chance to uh, chat with the owners the other day. And I've also now tried the product. Uh, It's naturally it's clean uh, is what it is called. And this stuff's outstanding. Um, And you guys know. I'm a clean guy. You know it. I've got a little Danny Tanner streak in me. You guys know I, you know, I geek out over new cleaning products. Okay. This stuff is really effective. Uh, the other day the dog got sick. I don't know what that was that came out of my little Bichon's body. I, I, you didn't try to give him away again, did you? I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually felt some pity for him. I, I just, <laughs> I'm not sure what that was. It was not normal. It is cert- was certainly most not mammalian. I don't know what it was. I thought maybe the aliens had landed in my living room and they were sh- short of cone shaped, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, thankfully, we used the naturally it's clean pet and odor remover and you wouldn't even know it was there. This stuff is outstanding. I used it in our, I used the laundry detergent yesterday as well. Uh, great products. They have specialized formulas for every area of the home with powerful plant-based enzymes. These are hospital-grade solutions that won't reek of nasty chemicals at the exact same time. The starter kit features four of their most popular products. Uh, And if you want to try it, get 15% off for a limited time by visiting Naturally It's Clean, ITS, by the way, naturallyitsclean.com slash Steve. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Steve. These are great Americans, great patriots, great fans of the blaze. Check them out today. Get your essential starter kit by visiting naturallyitsclean.com slash Steve. All right, coming up a little bit later on next hour, we will get into some Feedback Friday, but let us begin, as we always do, with the Dace Group. Your weekly look at the week that was begins, as it always does, with issue one, bleep, Lord Nefarious says. So proud of uh, Sister Roma and her work uh, in the community, and I'm proud of California for standing strong uh, in, uh, to support uh, LGBTQ people as our community is under assault uh, in the rest of the country. Sister Roma went on to say it's an incredible honor to have been nominated. She says being recognized not only means a lot to her, but the LGBTQ community at large. Well, our country is at very real risk of backsliding on freedom and equality. I think where it largely comes from is uh, folks who don't want to talk about why they were against the infrastructure law that's building the roads and bridges. I'm 
a teacher in the district. I also teach at LUSD. I have two students in the district. And so I deal with a lot of their trauma related to the heteronormative, Judeo-Christian, patriarchal, imperialist, capitalist system that oppresses them. And so why critical race theory? I'm not just here in support of our LGBTQ youth. It's all connected. I'm in support of critical race theory um, and diversity inclusion, equity training, because White people participated, for, for example, in the largest social welfare program in the history of the United States, and yet now they throw their hands up in the air when we look at our housing crisis. And Armenians talk about the genocide, but they received SSI, but they don't want to talk about the indigenous genocide. <laughs> If, if the problem is that, oh, people aren't going to be able to upload things that Republicans are saying, maybe Republicans should stop saying it, right? Is that not the solution to the problem? I From the woman who, when she was getting paid by Fox, wrote books about the left silencing free speech. And I haven't mentioned this in many years, but I'll bring it up again. In 2013... Uh, I, when I was still writing for USA Today, when they would still publish people like me and employ people like me rather than uh, attempt to cancel us or shun us, I, I wrote the second most read column of the year uh, at USA Today in defense of uh, the Duck Dynasty guys after Phil's comments about the birds and the beast. I think it was to GQ magazine. Mm -hmm. The number one column of that year, the most read column at USA Today in 2013. Do you remember what it was? Yes, hers. It was hers. Writing a, uh, chastising the media for ignoring the Kermit Gosnell story. That was the most read column of the year at USA Today in 2013. So, working Penub, folks. We'll, we'll blog, we'll talk, we'll post for food, uh, depending on how the check clears. A lot of that going around these days. Uh, hate the game, not the grifter. Let's get to the first question. Rachel, ladies first, plus you're the guest, so you get the first crack at it. What was the most vile and disgusting thing that you just saw? When I watched that cop arresting the protester who was just reading Romans 1 or whatever he was reading, I, I was so struck by how just laissez-faire, he just looked like a normal dad bod donut eating cop that would be on any of these streets. This was in Pennsylvania. And for him to say, let them have their day as if they don't have an entire year, as if they don't have our entire culture. And then the guy just says, hey, what's wrong? And he's like, that's it. And then grabs him by the, by the wrists and arrests him and throws him in in prison that was just such a weird snap like i'm upset in the moment cop i'm gonna arrest you and throw you in prison thing that scared me and so i know everybody has been saying oh you know listen they're locking you up for what you say they're locking you up for christian faith they've been doing this for a long time we've been seeing them doing it in canada for a long time but that was just it struck me because that wasn't la that wasn't dc that mm -hmm. was like it looked like just normal middle america that's uh just following orders guy yeah. That's who that is. And he'll feel, you know, he'll tisk tisk and feign feeling bad about it. Uh, but uh, he will he will walk you to the gulag at gunpoint. Nevertheless, Todd. Yeah, Rachel is absolutely on to something about that. This is everywhere now. Just normal looking cop guy. Every state. But we're, we're still going to laugh track this thing and meme it like the first one. Oh, look at that stupid what scott wiener guy mm -hmm. that's california yes that's california but that right there is is everywhere that right there is why i am a catholic refugee at des moines christian because it was dominating an exurbs semi-rural school district called carlisle iowa that right there is actually scaring all kinds of men into silence. I can't say anything. I can't do anything. Just keep my head low. You know, try to try to be normal. So I don't offend those people. The, the, yes, they lost here in Iowa legislatively and in a lot of other states. Stuff like that. The reaction to that in terms of school choice, but, uh, getting the, the porn out of the schools. There are many legislative victories. But those people won't stop. 
they pivot to something else. And when they're that brazen like that, look look at that scene. The, my, I was mentioning, Steve, off air, the movie 300. It's a fantastic movie. But the, the Persians there are depicted, and that's a not a comic book, a graphic, a graphic novel, and it's carried over into the movie. The Persian army there is, is depicted as half-human people, like cyclops people, crab people, but it's meant to depict that. We are being ruled right now by the Persians in this country. We are not America anymore. Don't laugh that away if that's just California. It's... It is on your doorstep, everywhere you go, Rachel is right. And those cops, there's, those cops, if you protest against the crab people, they'll arrest you for doing it. Todd, I'm sorry, Aaron. Yeah, this is, we are seeing the signs of a nation whose leaders in most places are not just uh, agnostic or don't believe nothing. They are actively opposed to God. You see more stuff like this when that happens. And um, we're seeing it every day, every, every single, uh, every single headline. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say it's the, the video out of, it was Canada. It was a Canadian school on, uh, in St. John's in uh, Newfoundland, whatever the, the other word for that province is. We are a long way from, again, uh, we just want the tax benefits and visitation rights of traditionally married couples. Mm-hmm. Now it's welcome to Pride Day at school. And I'm showing your kids and dildos. I'm showing your kids dildos. Nothing says family friendly like Leather Daddy at a Pride convention. But yeah, yeah. Um, the nice, nice liberal lady in my, my hometown of Lamoni. I saw her post the other day uh, criticizing those who say, why is it in my face? Oh, you guys just you guys just uh, uh, liked it more when everybody was. Cl- it's just the cognitive dissonance is not just cognitive dissonance. Dissonance. It is what I just said before. It is spiritual darkness. It is a force. It is a religion actively opposed to God. And that's what this month. That's what this month is to these people. It is a celebration of the national religion. Homoglobia on full display. Hmm. I think we need to hammer home more and more often that this is the new national religion. And it's the fulfillment of the old saying to find out who it is that who it is whom truly lords over you, simply find out whom it is you're not allowed to truly offend. And that that applies here. Every government, every culture in the history of our species for 7000 years has been a theocracy. We have just been, it's just been a matter of who is the recognized Theo and what kind of ocracy is it? Uh, plutocracy. All right. Um, a democracy. What kind of ocracy is it? We're just debating the ocracy and the Theo, but they're all theocracies. All of them are. I mean, the Soviets uh, threw out uh, the church out of a place called the Kremlin, put their own government there and declared themselves to be God for the next 75 years. Every government's a theocracy, and this one is too, and you can see it uh, in the way our national institutions proudly, pun intended, fly the national colors. You are under, you are under the thumb of direct demonic influence. That's the point, and they want you to know. The idea that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is convincing us he doesn't exist is not true. The devil doesn't like losing control of his own branding doesn't like losing control of his own imaging but if you're going to if you're going to launch a revolt against almighty god right to his face if you got that kind of chutzpah the idea that you're just concerned about with these mere flesh bots down here these on this mortal coil uh, that you've got to feel like you've got to trick them and be subversive just give man i don't i'm not sure whose ego needs to be more put in check the enemies are our own with that with that theology no no, he just likes control of his own branding. And right now, he has control of it. So the, the free flag is flying now. Brutal honesty is coming out now. And we are, we are seconds away from red unitards and pitchfork kind of stuff. Because they can. Yeah. Yeah. And Taryn's point, it's explicitly anti-God, which means whatever you think your so-called protections are that have been the default of America so far... Uh, the, Read Elie Wiesel, please, and how quickly all these people had all these, they had heard of Auschwitz, they had heard of all this stuff, how quickly things went sideways. And all of a sudden, 
you were being rounded up here, you were rounded up there, and all of a sudden the train cars keep coming. I, I mentioned this during lockdowns, remember, I watched this about 10 year old BBC documentary on the rise of the Third Reich with a lot of uh, exclusive eight millimeter film that Hitler himself kept uh, in the early years of his ascendancy and regime. And the, the documentary begins with um, early silent film footage of Germany at the turn of the century, man. And it, it looks like something out of a futuristic film from, oh, that, yeah. from that, you know, uh, like Utopia or mm -hmm. Metropolis or something. And this is really downtown Berlin. This is what really what, what Hamburg looked like. And this was the most enlightened, educated, prosperous, most powerful country on earth at the dawn of the 20th century. And I think this footage was from 1905, 1906, so very early silent film footage. And within one generation, now by the time we get to 1945, within one generation, the, the young people born into that period of German history, by the time they would reach you, the age that you and I have already yeah. surpassed, by the time they would get into their mid-40s, in their lifetime, they would see Germany plunge the world into not one but two existential cataclysmic conflicts that rewrote the rules and the and, and the staggering um, implications of weapons of mass destruction and global warfare. Whether it was the use of gas and the and the and, and airfare for the first time in World War One, or the use of Blitzkrieg and atom and w atomic weapons and you know huge bombing runs over long stretches of sea that were never possible before in human history in World War Two. One generation, one. Exit question. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the odds that Rachel arouses Lindsey Graham, and 10 being the odds that Todd does. Rank this week's level of total depravity, Todd. Whatever marital bliss you had before this, Rachel, we're going to ruin it today. <laughs> 10. Aaron. 10. Indeed. Uh, before we get to issue two, a reminder about our friends over at Patriot Mobile. I know we are starving for the emergence of the parallel economy. It's not coming overnight. Thankfully, one place, though, where it already is, is with a device we all have to use in this modern age, our mobile phones. Make the switch now to our friends over at Patriot Mobile. They've got outstanding customer service. I get it. My family, we put it off for years, too. Just thought it would be a big hassle. Finally, when T-Mobile decided they were going to start censoring my texts during lockdowns, that was the last straw. I finally just made the call and said, okay, I don't care how big of a hassle it is with our family and everything else. We've got to get out of this place. They made it as seamless as possible. They've been great ever since. They've got outstanding customer service. For example, if you are a member and it's you move to a different part of your city or state where one network is better than another or an entirely different city or state and one network is better than the other, you can switch to any of the three major networks anytime you want for absolutely free because you're a member of Patriot Mobile. They've got some goodies as well to say thank you for your service if you're a veteran or first responder when you decide to make the switch today. For the rest of us, get a free activation with the offer code Steve when you go to PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. Again, that is PatriotMobile.com slash Steve or you can call them at 878 Patriot. Let's get to issue two. RFK Jr. Democrat presidential hopeful Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joined Twitter owner Elon Musk for a Spaces event and covered a lot of ground, including free speech. Free speech and the free flow of information is the water, it's the sunlight, it's the fertilizer, it's the soil of democracy. Without it, democracy withers and dies. There's never been a time in history when we look back and say that the people who were censoring free speech were the good guys. They're always the bad guys. They're always, it's always the first step toward totalitarianism. RFK Jr. also went to the border in the dead of night earlier this week, and this is what he saw. From Peru, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, China, Tibet, Nepal, and all together, uh, people have come across right here from 117 nations in the last couple of years. In three years, in total, seven million people have come across the border illegally into our country. And from here, they're put on these buses And they're brought to the Border Patrol station where they're processed. After four or five days, they're released on their own reconnaissance. 
into our country and most of them are never seen or heard from again. All right, I want us, each of us here, to fill in the blank, or each of you, I should say, you're the panel. Um, fill in the blank. And you can put anything in the blank that you want. Just explain why you put it there. As a presidential candidate, RFK Jr. is blank. Aaron, you're first. I think he is a threat. Now, is he a realistic... No, is, is he, does he have realistic uh, chances of winning the Democrat nomination? Maybe not at this point, but he's a threat. Like anybody who is awake, not woke, is a threat. Now, he may espouse some things that the, woke, uh, the wokesters espouse as well, but based on the fact, just I'm just analyzing this from human nature, from a human nature standpoint. He has, he believes something deep down. I think he really does. Something that is not just completely in line, given over to the spirit of the age. And in this day and age in our society and politics, nihilism reigns, which means anybody who believes anything other than nihilism is a threat. Mm -hmm. So that's why I believe the blank there. Regardless of what the other is. Regardless of what the other ism is. Yeah. Rachel, what do you think? I think RFK Jr. is cathartic because I am loving the fact that he is making all the right people uncomfortable. We can be, our people can be righteous on Ukraine. Our people can be righteous on the deep state and nobody really listens to them because they're quote our people. Mm -hmm. So the fact that RFK can go on and say, yeah, uh, you know, take a look at the border or I don't know if you guys saw his interview with Cavuto yesterday, which he was like, listen, we've all killed 300,000 kids. Cavuto leaps out of a seat nearly as is possible for Cavuto and says, no, wait, you mean the Russians, right? And RFK Jr. would not let him have any sort of room on pushing back about how we need to be over in Ukraine. So I'm with Aaron. I don't know how successful he'll be, to be honest with you. I don't think they, they being the people that killed his dad and his his uncle uh, will have uh, that will let him play this out. But man, that guy is so righteous. I'm afraid to look under the hood on some of the issues like life and climate change, because mm-hmm. I know I'll probably find something I, I disagree with. Mm-hmm. But he has been very cathartic for me to get somebody like Neil Cavuto very uncomfortable in the, in, in, on this show. That's well said, Todd. Uh, he, he saw Guerrero. That's a great analogy. He's from Rogue, Rogue One, played by, um, forgive me. I just watched that this week, actually. What's the actor's name? Uh, Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker, thank yeah. you. Yeah, And there's a great line in the trailer for that movie that didn't make it into the movie itself, and I don't really know why, but it's by the main uh, character when she says, we're rebels, aren't we? I rebel. Like this, are we serious about this or not? I don't know what it was about him actually being damaged by... Uh, vaccines and rachel's right he's not a conservative in the way he's not a conservative at all but like listen like why are we even applying that label or that standard to him whatever that thing he's is, what aaron talked about earlier he's just not a nihilist yeah. well, he might be a, a, a liberal non-nihilist but he is not he he is aspirational he is not yeah. a nihilist right yeah. and whatever that thing is that we that template is quite frankly broadly speaking you know, we haven't been very good at that. In many issues, I think he's prepared to be better at it in opening eyes, in exposing Overton windows and things like that. He's a real, like, there's, I love the tension of that movie about different kinds of rebels and the ones who still think, like, maybe there's a certain way of doing this thing. And he's like, uh, no, it's, it, this is the 11th hour kind of thing. I, I think the man just gets it, and we would be wise to go in his direction in terms of being unapologetic in the fight, not worrying about being couth. The guy will go into any lion's den, and he's always prepared. When's the last time you saw him come out of... Heck, the, only, the last time he came out on a losing argument uh, is, is when he uh, used the term Nazi, and the only reason he apologized that because his wife made him do it, mm-hmm. and she's an actress. So there's some, there's some danger signs there, but listen, this, this guy is Saw Guerrera. He's a real rebel. He's unapologetic about it. And he's willing to take it to the end. That is a great analogy, Todd. So that begs a follow-up question. Did he make a mistake? Because what does Saw Guerrero do? 
he recognizes working within the confines of uh, you know Mon Mothma's yes. soft yes. woke rebellion yes. ain't gonna cut it man and so he goes off and does his own thing yes did he make a mistake running as a Democrat should he have just run a Ross Perot campaign from the very beginning as a as a third party independent general election candidate not not necessarily it all depends on Rachel and what she just said right there like if he's he, he's got to realize that like if all of a sudden I make like abortion and climate change even if i believe it the heart of this Mm -hmm. all the other stuff is going to get drowned out and you're going to like it it really depends on him so Mm -hmm. rachel's instincts are right about which rocks he decides to turn over same question to both of you did he make a mistake running as a democrat should he have just run a perot uh you know insurgency candidacy from the beginning rachel what do you think I don't think so, because I think it puts Democrats, albeit there's really no, this is just theater that's entertaining to me, so this doesn't really actually mean one thing or the other, but running as a Democrat makes Democrats go on the record and really have to have the uncomfortable position of picking. So he gets these questions like, you know, should Biden be on the same stage as you? He's really going to make the establishment have to care one way or another in a way that I think they could have just shaken him off if he wasn't independent. And also, I I, I say this sort of half-joking, but I'm not when I'm saying, like, we don't control our elections anymore. We don't control our electorate anymore. And I'm very curious to see how the deep state, arguably RFK is probably one of two people, in my opinion, three people maybe, that could destroy the deep state if he became president. I'm curious to see how they handle him moving forward because I am under no illusions that this guy is just going to be free to speak his mind uh, at the convenience of what Biden, who is the the, the heir apparent on the Democrat Party, is going to be. I'm curious to see how they handle him in a way that they weren't forced to handle him if he was an independent. Aaron? Yeah, absolutely not. He didn't make a mistake by running as a Democrat, if for no other reason than his last name. You're going to force hmm. the Democrat apparatus yeah. to tarnish the Kennedy name as kooky anti-vaxxers. Good luck. Absolutely. That is absolutely. a great point. That's a great point. You're forcing them to argue against the most powerful brand name since FDR that they have had as a party that they have even well into, you know, Aaron and Rachel's lifetimes, they, they've still seen the Democratic Party try to cash in on that name and that, that visual. All right, let's get to the exit question. Who has a better chance of being their party's nominee? Mike Pence or RFK Jr.? Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike Pence. Pence. Rachel. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? No way, no way. RFK Jr., I work, I work for the guy. I love Mike Pence. He is, at this point, I think we can all agree that there are some bot-like tendencies going on in some of the speeches that he's giving. I don't think he can even get anywhere close to the top three as the nominee. And I think we are better off of RFK having like four or five contingency plans against the deep state trying to take him out and somehow he survives. I think he's well more equipped at being his nominee than Pence. I agree with Rachel. I mean, I, I, I don't think his odds are great, but I think, I think they're more than 10%. Which, again, isn't great. And, and here's why I would... And, and we keep overlooking the New Hampshire issue. That, the logistics of that. And the reason why the, the, you know, the regime media doesn't want to talk about it is because it's uncomfortable for them. They, they tried to move South Carolina number one. New Hampshire law says New Hampshire has to go number one. New Hampshire's, what is it, four electoral college votes? Are, yeah. are vital. Vital. You, do you want to go in there and say, if you're the Democrats right away, hey, we will take your delegates, we'll rob you of your delegates if you hold that first in the nation primary. That is also right in the backyard of, of Boston and Mass, and that's Kennedy territory, and that name still has a lot of gravitas. I, I think he's got 25, 30% odds of winning the New Hampshire primary. Now, whether those delegates count or not, it's a very delicate situation for the Democratic Party. And I think that's why it doesn't get discussed. I think most people still don't know South Carolina is first in the nation for the Democrats because this has not been discussed a lot. His candidacy poses some real problems with them there, and they are not. This is going largely unnoticed. The gladly quadruple jabbed Democrat Party is going to vote for Ken. No, no, it's impossible. I could see a scenario where RFK could win New Hampshire if Biden never bothers to show up. Oh. I could see that. Now, what it means moving forward, maybe nothing. I don't know. All right, when we come back, another indictment looms we will discuss next.
All right, back here on the Steve Day Show. If you are looking for a way out for your child from leftist propaganda, endless pronouns, critical racist theory, porn to minors, et cetera, you know, the Satan's youth ministry that government education in too many places has become. If you're looking for an option, look no further than our friends at Freedom Project Academy. I can tell you about them firsthand. My own son Noah went to FPA for a couple of years. Uh, I know the people like Dr. Duke Pesta who helped establish this school. We fought together back in the day against Common Core uh, and more. Uh, built on Judeo-Christian values with a classical curriculum. We use that phrase a lot. That's one of the buzzwords on the right, classical curriculum. What does it mean? In essence, it means being taught how to think, not what to think, bringing critical thinking back, uh, being taught uh, mastery of subject matter that actually matters, not being subjected so that you can later be mastered. Uh, that's what it means. Save 2% or 10%, I should say, on tuition if you enroll today. Save 10% on your tuition if you enroll today at Freedom for School, the word for freedomforschool.com. You can also think, hey, I just want to get some more information right now. I'm searching. I'm looking at options. Uh, they, have, they have a free information packet. You bet. You can get that as well at freedomforschool.com, freedomforschool.com. Let's bring back in Rachel Semmel, newlywed, newly crowned, newlywed. Rachel Semmel from the Center for Renewing America. Let's get to issue three, Trump indictment part two. Donald Trump has been indicted by a federal jury out of Florida under the Espionage Act for alleged mishandling of classified documents prior to him leaving the White House. Trump took to Truth Social last night in reaction to the news and posted this video. Very sadly, we're a nation in decline, and yet they go after a popular president, a president that got more votes than any sitting president in the history of our country, by far, and did much better the second time in the election than the first. And they go after him on a boxes hoax, just like the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, and all of the others. This has been going on for seven years. They can't stop because it's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened I'm an innocent man. I'm an innocent person. All right. So a couple of things on this, just to clarify some things, because we don't know the full indictment yet. That's supposed to come out on Tuesday. Uh, it, 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 there was a, some speculation. Would there be just one big, there was never really any denial that there would be a DOJ indictment. This is something that we've been talking about on our show with our friend Julie Kelly from American Greatness pretty much this, the entirety of this year. Uh, the question was, would, how encompassing would it be? Would it include uh, the January 6th stuff they're trying, to, they're, trying to, they're trying to pin on him? Would it just be these documents? Um, and now it appears that they have made these two separate issues. The, the issue in Miami will just be about the documents, as Aaron pointed out, and still the January 6th stuff to come uh, will come later uh, with the D.C. Star Chamber. Uh, Trump uh, got about 43 percent of the vote in Miami-Dade County in 2020. Why is that relevant? Because evidence doesn't matter um, in, when, with a politicized uh Judiciary. All that matters is the ideology of the potential of the uh, potential jury pool and the, uh, the the or the appointed judge, whoever will be the one rendering the final or the ones rendering the final verdict here. So there is a jury pool there where at least by a sliding scale, he could get some form at least, I guess, fairer. I don't know if I'd say the word fair. How about fairer than what will happen in Manhattan? In Manhattan, he will be convicted of felonies. I mean, he only won 12 percent of the vote there. Uh, that jury pool that indicted him on 34 felonies, um, they're going to convict him. Uh, he will be convicted there next year. I, I, don't, I don't know how there's even much doubt about that. Uh, he'll be found guilty of uh, being named Donald Trump. Uh, so there's more we could say. I put up a pretty exhaustive Twitter thread about it earlier today. Um, I just I know a lot of people have a lot to say about this. Rachel, I want to start with you. Having worked in the Trump administration, obviously, we should give you first crack at this. And the floor, sister, is yours. Go ahead. Well, yeah, your tweet thread was very good, Steve, and I encourage everybody to read that. I think for those who are sick of the noise, sick of the headlines, indictment this, Trump that, and they're kind of just maybe even to, to, extent, to the same extent that I was during Russiagate, like wake me up when it's over. And it's hard to understand exactly what happened last night when you step back and say, a, 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 a regime using evidence that we probably will never see because it's going to be classified using what we're hearing is probably, you know, the Espionage Act, an antiquated, unconstitutional relic of World War One, to 
essentially take a former president and current political rival of Joe Biden off the side off the table and onto the sidelines. And when you hear more about how Biden was America First Legal uncovered, how uh, Biden administration was directly involved in the Mar-a-Lago raid, it's so it's so scary to see that this is just essentially the bureaucracy telling us it's it's them now. It's not us, we the people. But there'll, there'll be a million things to say about the Trump indictment. You've said it better than I can say. But what I think a lot of people aren't realizing is at the very same time the Trump indictment was handed down yesterday, last night, within two or three minutes, my colleague Jeff Clark, who is a director of litigation at uh, uh, Center for Renewing America, former Trump DOJ, uh, one of the top DOJ officials, he got served essentially what they're hoping is a death sentence for his career and something. Mm that has never been seen before, which is the D.C. bar taking away his law license. And yeah. last night, the federal judge, uh, a federal judge who has never had something like this before, said, you know what, D.C. bar, have at him, take his law license away. We don't like his politics. Make sure he's never a practicing lawyer. Harvard-educated lawyer who oversaw more departments at the DOJ than anyone else, take his law license away. The raid at his house wasn't enough. That was minutes uh, surrounding uh, the Trump indictment. So you had choreographed information. The Washington Post, the at Politico were calling me a day or two before this. So I knew something was up. I, what I didn't realize was that federal judge is going to hand down the Jeff Clark what she hopes is a death sentence the same time the Trump indictment did. So this is all part of something way, way bigger than all of us. I want to let that last part there just kind of hang in the air for a minute. Because because of how well it pays in my industry, because of how well a lot of the people that consume our content are paid, the, life, the lives of convenience that we are allowed to have, okay? We on the right have often, for too many years, wasted time talking about things that either were never going to happen or um, were irrelevant. I believe there was 36 hours of... of of, of Twitter yesterday was when is it okay to use AI in a meme? Um, I, I, are you kidding me? Meanwhile, Rachel's telling me, well, they were called me like three days ago. It was clearly, I told you guys yesterday, I had a, I had a reporter from a very venerable platform within corporate media. Tell me on Tuesday that this was coming imminently. So here's the thing too, is understand what Rachel and I just told you is they, they were coordinating all this with their media. They had all their ducks in a row. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now we've got we've got Fox trying to say Tucker Carlson can't post on social yeah. media for three years or two years. OK, I mean, this the, the let's pretend Ron DeSantis was never born for a minute. Can we do that? And let's pretend there's not a competitive primary happening here and we can all debate how competitive it is. It is at least somewhat to some degree. Let's pretend it's not. We're not having another presidential inauguration for 595 days. 595 days. Could be a lot of Donald Trump's, Jeff Clark's, Mark Houck's, and the next, for, for, over the course of five, 595 days ago, we weren't sure we'd ever get to send the kids back to school again without masks. 595 days ago, you couldn't talk yet about what the true origins of the virus might be without getting banned. 595 days ago, you thought, the vi you thought the jab was safe and effective and took it, okay? A lot of poop can go down and change at the, the current rate of devolution and late republic nonsense in 595 days. What do we do about this for the next 595 days? What do we do? Maybe there's nothing to do, but that, that's what's on my mind. I said I wanted us all to say what was on our minds. That's what's on my mind right now. For the next mass protest, I don't know. A lot of our people stayed home and dutif stayed in their homes and dutifully watched George Floyd funerals this time in 2020. And then they got their kids masked up to go to grandma's house. Donald Trump got 6 million votes in California. 1% of that would be 6 million just wasted votes. There was no point to voting. Just a wasted vote. If 1% of those people lived in Arizona, Georgia, were spread out over Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, Donald Trump would be president right now. Because the margin in those three decisive states was 45,000 votes. 1% would be 60,000 people. 
I mean, we can't get our people to leave California where their votes don't matter and move where they, their citizenship does. So I, someone, I, I, I don't know. I'm going to think about this over the weekend. We're going to discuss this more in depth on the show Monday in the second hour. What, what is the solution here other than just hope some good person gets, nom- get, gets to take the oath of office 595 days from now? That's what's on my mind. Todd, what's on yours? Well, Rachel, you are absolutely right about what Steve asked to hang in the air, that uh, there's something bigger going on here than all of us. Unfortunately, one of those things is that all of us don't believe that there's something bigger here Preach on that. going on yeah. than all of us, which is, this is also the Babylon Bee cracked a joke about uh, the reason Joe Biden isn't guilty is because he hid in his uh, documents in a safe place like a trunk of a Corvette. OK, it, it, that, that, that on the very same day that more and more evidence comes out about the Biden crime family vis-a-vis Ukraine, that this happens as well. Like, this is obvious. My point being, the lie is the point. They're not they're not being sneaky. They are telling you this isn't about justice. We know it's unjust. We love it. We hate you. We plan on destroying you. We believe you are so cowardly and weak. There's nothing you will do about it. Folks, the lie is the point. And if you will not confront that as a citizen, you aren't really a citizen. You are saying you are fine, just fine. In fact, you prefer being a slave. Aaron, what's on your mind? I do not care for Donald Trump's personality whatsoever. I detest the vast majority of his online army. He is by far the best president of my lifetime, and most of your lifetimes as well. You could even compare him to Reagan, I would guess, most of you. That's how I see things. That doesn't matter one jot or tittle. What matters in cases like these, and the lawfare that they are waging, this is not just lawfare. What matters is how they see things. Mm Mm-hmm. Over in communist land, they don't care about Donald Trump's personality. They don't care about these intra-party squabbles that we have on a daily basis. Like using an AI image, jokingly, for five seconds in a montage. They, they, they don't give a rip about that. What they give a rip about is punishing you. Absolutely. And this is a gateway that they are opening up a portal here. They are opening up a portal with the whatever this is that they've got cooking up. And we'll find out here within the next, I would say, 60 days or so, probably, about whatever they're coming for him on January 6th. They are opening up a portal by going after him on charges like this with tortured legal theory like this and the the 34 sham felonies in New York City. They are opening up a portal here to come after you and me. Ask Mark Houck. Ask Jeff Clark, getting photographed in his underoos because the FBI, because he, because he dared ally himself with somebody who allies himself with you. They are opening up a portal to hell on earth. <laughs> Here, you don't have to draw a very, you don't have to draw a very long line at all, or very many lines at all, between what they're doing to Donald Trump here regardless of what you or I or anyone thinks about him. You don't have to draw very many lines here to what they're attempting to do with Donald Trump and what they would like to do to you and me here in flyover country. That's the reality and that's the stakes we're playing for. Guys, I don't have time. Okay? We have very little time left Mm -hmm. for circle jerks. I don't have very much time for that. I'm 30 years old. You know who has no time for that if we continue to play the circle jerk game? Just, hey, let's get our jollies off over the latest uh, fight. I got in on it a little bit yesterday, too. You know, just because I couldn't stand seeing a, a senator amplifying this BS about AI images. You know who has no time at all? My two year old, almost two year old, who's at the zoo. If we continue going down this road where we do not get serious about what's really happening here and start formulating answers beyond, hey, let's get our latest talking points. You know who's going to have zero time at all? It's it's that two year old and and you guys as kids as well. Mm -hmm. That's the stakes we're playing for. 
Let me close this with some good news. I just got an email from Steve Crampton, who is the senior counsel with the Thomas More Society. They're one of the venerable legal... They represented uh, Mark Houck. Yes, one of the venerable legal foundations on the right. Just a quick word to follow up on your coverage of the outrageous arrest of Damon Atkins in reading Pennsylvania last week. They've already dropped the charges. We were geared up to aggressively defend him in the case, and, he, and we were informed yesterday that the charges against him had been dropped. So you do provide a little sunlight, some aggression, and pushback. You still can get some W's, but you have to be willing to push back. Let's get to our kicker topic, because if it's spring... It's budget season, so we need an alien psyop, all right? And man, now the aliens are malevolent. Now they're landing in someone's yard in Nevada, right? We came out with this uh, whistleblower from the, in, from, the, from the IC, and it, it didn't rate at all, so they keep you know, doubling, tripling down very quickly. Tell me, what would it take, what would the government have to, to do to get you to believe in extraterrestrials, Todd? Show me one. That's a good place to start. Rachel, what about you? What would the government have to do? Uh, nothing. I'll, I'll be honest. You guys may not know this. You are talking to somebody who has been to Area 51 twice in her life. Right outside Area 51 is a little town called Rachel, Nevada. So, of course, I ran the extraterrestrial half marathon there twice in a row <laughs> to see with my own two eyes at midnight if there were aliens. I saw none. So, as far as I'm concerned, I, I didn't see any. There's nothing the government can convince me of otherwise. Very good. Aaron, go quick. I need to see an extraterrestrial ra- uh, 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 raising and waving a, a, a pride flag a ukraine flag or yeah. a pride flag yeah. okay all right that's predictions they got to be really quick aaron go uh, donald trump uh will continue to run for president and he will be the nominee regardless of any of this rachel uh S- steve's uh Michigan Wolverines are probably going to win the national championship this year and there i say that only only to what say what are you doing rachel for- <laughs> Don't. Only, only to say that Purdue is not going to be anywhere near. So I'm going to bandwagon just this season, just for you, Steve. There is plenty of room on the on the bandwagon of the winningest yeah. program of all time, sister. Thought Hop you had aboard, more class Todd. Than that, Rachel. Yes. Aliens and the Wolverines. Good grief. Uh, I forgot. She so threw me off about that. Oh, the the uh, Pride Month, the month of June is will be all summer long. It's not going anywhere. I'm going to predict that Georgia will become only the second unanimous number one team in the history of the preseason AP poll going back to 1950. It's only happened one other time. Defending national champion Ohio State was a preseason unanimous number one in 2015. Didn't even win the Big Ten that year, by the way. Because Purdue beat them. That's right. That's one of the reasons why. You're right. On October 8th, I rushed the field. That's right. That uh, That was a great night. I remember it very well. All right. Good to see you, Rachel. Thank you. All right, Feedback Friday is next. Stay tuned. All right, back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here alongside Aaron McIntyre, Todd Erzin, and all of you. And all of you, although hopefully not all at once, can let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. Email the show, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Day Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. That's again, D-E-A-C-E. You can also um, find me on Truth Social at Real Steve Dace there. For all of you that listen via the podcast, we appreciate each and every one of you so very much. Please, if you wouldn't mind, show your appreciation for us by uh, leaving us a five-star review, if you like us, of course, uh, hitting subscribe, or if you listen on iTunes, follow, and those things help to boost the show, not to mention our fragile male egos, and that's why we appreciate each and every one of them. We also need to appreciate our livers a little bit more. It's one of the key organs in the body, and more stress is placed on it as we get older, and that's where our friends uh, over at uh, Pure Health, that's where they come in. Uh, because they're concerned that 100 million Americans may have what is called fatty liver, which means you're at risk because we throw everything at our livers these days, cholesterol, alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, statins, still about one out of every five Americans still smokes cigarettes. That's why a lot of times we have a sluggish fatty liver can make us gain weight, lose energy. And now it is time to help your liver That's been helping you with 500 key functions each and every day with the solution known as the liver health formula, an all natural supplement, which contains 12 clinically proven botanicals that help to recharge and protect your liver. Manufactured right here in the USA by American doctors. If you want to try the liver health formula and receive a free gift 
of their nano-powered omega-3s to keep your heart healthy as well. Just go to getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Once again, head over to getliverhelp.com slash Steve. Getliverhelp.com slash Steve. All right, you guys ready for some Feedback Friday? Yes. Yep. Okay. Let's begin with Karen. And before you said gird your loins, this is a good one. This is one of the good Karens. Uh, Karen writes, the friends and I just rented Nefarious. I had mentioned this movie to them, but the closest it came to our neck of the woods was a theater in Wilmington. So we waited for it to come out on streaming. My friends are not believers. So we wanted them to definitely see it. We were all going to watch it at the same time, but they thought it was, they saw that it was available and rented it on their own. Here were their comments. Quote, it was amazing. I kept going back repeatedly to view sections again and again. So tonight, we all watched it together, and unanimous, it was amazing. My friend stated clearly, I need to buy this DVD and the book. As I left, I said, maybe y'all should think about going to church. Just saying. The chasm is getting wider between good and evil. We need to reach out in creative ways to those we care about. And Nefarious is a great example. Karen, thank you. Uh, You made my day. And I have, I mean, I'm approaching a thousand emails like this. I've, I've... I can't respond to them all. I, there's been too many. I, I have kept them all, though. I want you guys to know I have kept every single one. I created in my email account a folder specifically for nefarious feedback because um, who knows? This may be the only time I ever do something like this in my life. And I wanted to remember uh, all of all of you that uh, let me know how much the movie impacted you or people you know and how much you appreciated it. So thank you so much, Karen. Um, we have received some incredible feedback about this film. I, I'm not at liberty to tell you guys the numbers, but I will tell you our first five days of revenue on streaming before we even got on Amazon, which is Amazon and iTunes are our YouTube are the three big ones in streaming. And depending on who you talk to it is, is whether they get ranked one, two or three by some uh, metrics, Amazon is number one. So this was even before we got on to Amazon. And our first five days of revenue was incredible. I just got this call last night. Just blew me away when I heard the number. So maybe maybe our investors got a fighting chance here. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, but the key thing that that means is people are, are more people are now seeing it too or seeing it again. So if you've yet to see Nefarious, now, man, Amazon is not helping us. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't want to get anybody to believe who might make future, who's probably going to make future movies in trouble. So I won't say what the issue with Amazon was. Let's just say it was dumb. I'll leave it at that. Now Amazon is doing us no favors. Like you have to search for the movie. That's not like I was on the app last night. It's, it's not prominently listed anywhere. They did. It, it's very common for Amazon to put IMDb ratings of the movies when you click on it. So you know what the IMDb rating? Our IMDb rating is high. It's like 6.8 out of 10. That's a very high IMDb score. And our, our, you can't find the movie easily. It, it does, the listing does not include our IMDb score. But if you do go and search for Nefarious on Amazon Prime, it is now there. But we have been we have been killing it on Google slash YouTube. We've been top five there since we came out. Uh, we've been top ten on Vudu. Um, I mean, so uh, this the, the the streaming launch of Nefarious has gone above our expectations, actually. So want to say thank you to all of you for that. And again, you can stream it right now if you want to. Uh, Amazon Prime, Apple iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Salem Now, Dish. Voodoo um, and Roku. It's up on Roku now uh, as well as I'm told. So, Don Ugliano in Newberry, Florida. How, how are you guys feeling right now? Am I feeling? Yeah, chill. You relaxed? You on edge? You on tilt? How are you feeling? I am Whatever now. it is, you plan on altering that? Yeah, I think this email is probably going to fire you up a bit. Don Ugliano in Newberry, Florida writes. My son, Sean, is a U.S. Army veteran. He has been denied Social Security disability. He is 45 and had a heart attack last year. He has seven stints and is on numerous medications. 
He also has chronic kidney stones, has been hospitalized over 20 times for this. He is a paramedic and unable to do his job, and he has a six-year-old child. He does have an attorney and will fight this. But here's my point in writing this to you. We and he have been watching the news and seeing millions of illegal aliens entering our country and being given all the benefits that he is seeking legally and yet denied. The unfairness of this situation is profound. Thank you and prayers from your audience are welcomed and needed. It's not unfair. It's on purpose. It's the lie is the point. They hate you. They want you to suffer. It's all by design. And yes, thank you for pissing the hell off of me. Yeah, if you had just calmed down after the conversation we were having about the Trump indictment last hour, that heart rates back up a little bit now, isn't it? Good grief. I mean, plus, my, I, I don't know where this is going. My, you know, my, my uh, daughter's boyfriend, they've been together for two years. He just, he's a Marine now. The, my level of concerns for him and her. Hey, my daughter just married a kid, a, a young yeah. man in the National Guard, so I get it, man. Yeah. I get it, yeah. Since it's in the passivity of the average person who has forsaken their citizenry. They, they, it's your job, just like the person in the military, your job as a citizen is to stand a post. A republic, if you can keep it, and you just can't be bothered. For a hundred different, godless, stupid, trivial, trite, nonsensical reasons, you can't be bothered while they trans your kids, while they poison your children, mind, body, and soul, and your military men. It's never ending. Everywhere you turn, there's, there's something worth fighting for, and no one will do it. What Todd just said is critical to understand the, the mind of the opposition, the enemy that we are up against. And I would add this as well. You know, when you, put a f when, when you try to put, start putting faces on, well, who is this opposition? You know, it, it can go a number of different directions, some of them helpful, some of them not. But I think what helped me understand this enemy that we were, are up against. Progressivism, spirit of the ageism, what have you. I said last hour, it is fundamentally not just godless, but recognizing God and opposed to him. Right. Like anti. Anti-God. Yes. Yeah. These people, whether it's the corrupt DOJ going after Donald Trump, whether it's any number of community leaders in your small to large to medium-sized community, they're on the school board, they're on the city council, county commissioners, what have you. They're all around you who are totally bought and paid for by the spirit of the age. They do not want to merely conquer you. They don't even want to kill you. They would rather enslave you if you are opposed to that spirit of the age. Those are two different things. Typical conquerors, a Genghis Khan-like, they just want to conquer you. They want to kill and destroy. Those opposed to God are fine with you dying, yes, are fine with killing you, yes, are fine with putting enmity between you and your kids, yes. They have so much contempt for you that they would rather enslave you, though, rather keep you under their thumb. They don't really have much power over a dead body. That is what we're up against. Understand that. And they are hellishly, deathly devoted to accomplishing this goal. Look around you. I think you just drew a very important distinction that is biblical. The Bible draws a distinction between a lack of faith and unbelief. A lack of faith and unbelief. Let me make let me let me draw a political parallel. 
when I was Aaron's age and getting much more active, I've always been active in politics going to back to high school, but now in my adult years and Aaron's uh, th- about to turn 30 and so a family and then those sorts of things. We've got kids and stuff now. The, 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 tip, the argument was that we had on the right and the left is, is what is and isn't constitutional. Okay. Is something maybe well intentioned, but it's 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 unconstitutional. It's not it, it it doesn't align with the Constitution. What we have now is is we're doing things that are anti-constitutional. the The intent mm-hmm. is to undo the the previous constitutional framework, not to debate its reach or expand its reach or even to some degree redefine it, but to undo it. That's the that, and that's what what I mean by a lack of faith. And unbelief. The unbelief is the intent to undo that which was already done. And that's the era in which we live now. To put a finer, even finer theological point on it, a lack of faith equals sheep. Unbelief equals wolves. Feed sheep, shoot wolves, metaphorically speaking. Feed sheep, shoot wolves. Because what will the wolves do if permitted to have access to said sheep they will devour them because the wolf is a predator and the sheep is lost to borrow a line from one of my favorite theologians that I've quoted many times over the years St. Augustine there are many sheep without even more wolves within let's continue on a feedback Friday this is from Mark As two dads of women approximately my age, I was hoping that you would be able to provide me some advice with a situation that I am currently facing. Since January, I have slowly gotten to know a wonderful Catholic woman and her family, and I really think we could be a good match. She checks off more boxes than any other woman that I've met so far in my life. She has seemingly given me some positive signs, but I'm nowhere near confident that she is interested. Her parents definitely like me, and I would think perceive me as someone worthy of their daughter. The only hesitancy I have is the age gap. She is 18. And will be entering college in the fall while I am 23 and will be and have been out of college for three years now. Dude, you graduated college at 20? Because a lot of people nowadays when they go to college on the Ryan Reynolds plan and they ain't pre-med, if you know what I'm saying. Okay. It took me over 10 years to do (laughs) a bachelor's degree. I am pretty well established and am ready to start and support a family. How do you feel about this five year age gap? Also, do I have any obligations towards her parents before I do anything since I've come to know them along with her and her siblings? Pretty much every week after Mass, I have conversations with both of them and obviously their their daughter and her siblings. I want to be as respectful as possible, but also not make it into a bigger deal than it it is. I'd appreciate any advice, uh, as I think you guys are both in the perfect position to opine on how you would feel if a guy like me approached you about one of your daughters. And I'd also appreciate if you guys would keep my situation in your prayers. I really want to be a husband and a father one day, and I've wanted that for as long as I can remember. I'm just hoping that uh, this is his daughter and that he has decided to entrust this one to me. That's from Mark. You want to take this one first? The age gap is utterly unconsequential. It's not a gap. It's in terms of just time. Uh, But whenever the time comes to have that earnest and honest conversation about simply you know what her plans are were before you even came along at the age uh of 18 and how some of them may or may not change and whether that's okay that that's that's a life thing that's not an age thing but i there's you you had a pretty detailed email but there's more details i would need to know about you know what you know, going forward in terms of, you know, I don't know, school, career, all those things that those are the variables that you need to be open and honest about. But it, this, the raw numbers, the, you're, you're tell, 18 and 23 with a shared value system worldview, that, that's that's not that's not a gap. You're the same. Look around you. You're lucky to have found each other, for God's sake. So 23 and 18 are the, it's just utterly inconsequential. All right, since you attack the age thing, let me attack the other question with the family. I, I think I think because your primary interactions with her, from the sound of your note, have been in relationship to her family as a whole, just speaking for me as a dad, I would um I would expect 
that to be honored before it moved on to any more personal um, um, personal or intimate get togethers. And while I agree with what Todd said about the age thing, I don't know what her dad thinks about the age thing. So, I mean, you're both adults. You just are one with more life experience at this point. But as a just in case, my, I think this kind of tackles your issue at the same time by just having that conversation and saying, Hey, you know, would you be okay? You know, if I asked her out on a date, would you be all right with that? I want to make sure, you know, mm -hmm. and cause I certainly don't want to lose our interaction and engagements, you know, that I've enjoyed being around you and your family. I don't want to make it awkward. I, I would, I would, you know, you don't want, I'm not saying that this would happen. You don't ever want that dad to think that you just have been engaging him and his family so that you could get with his daughter and just kind of run off and do that off to right. the side. Absolutely. That's why I would, I would talk to him first if it was me. And I would suggest you do that. Fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to, actually, let's do this next. This is a great opportunity. Good segue, segue to talk about our friends over at Preborn. Uh, just take a minute and let's uh, discuss heartbeats. Uh, a strong heartbeat reminds you that you are alive. And it is the same with our unborn children. And that's why Preborn has built the truth part of their ministry around the heartbeat, confronting mothers. It is a confrontation. It might be gentle in terms of its temperament and tone by, say, my show standards, but it is a confrontation nevertheless to confront that mom with the heartbeat of her child so that she doesn't go through with killing it at about 80% of the time when confronted with that knowledge that that's a real person she's carrying. Moms... Moms don't go through with it, but then there's the grace part. And I love that. I love that preborn does them both. They provide the services and the support that moms still in crisis need, whether that's prenatal care, postnatal care, even car seats, counseling, and all of that is free of charge because of tax deductible donations from people like us. Our goal this year is to is here at the blaze to partner with preborn to save 70,000 babies in 2023. Help us reach that goal. Uh, just dial pound 250 on your mobile phone and say the keyword baby pound 250 and say the keyword baby on your mobile phone, or you can call them at preborn.com slash Steve. Once more, that is preborn.com slash Steve. All right, let's move on. Um, this is from, uh, Jack, I am wondering if you could provide any actionable steps I can take to positively move Georgia or any state into the right direction like you and those with you have been able to do in Iowa. I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson. I've thus tried to make my corner of the world better through various high school guys, small groups, and volunteering. However, I feel like it would be all for naught if Georgia descends into a woke cesspit. If you were a 26-year-old Georgia boy with no real connections, little money, and an already thinning hairline, <laughs> what would you do? Second question, what would Steve say to modern churches utter disregard for today's young men? We have a generation of guys flocking to somebody like Jordan Peterson or even an Andrew Tate because they want something instead of capitalizing on this and challenging young, young men to take up the crusade that God has made for them. We do nothing. Well, the second question is part of your answer to the first one, brother. Now, I didn't know who Andrew Tate was until he got arrested. What was it? Um, Romania or Bulgaria, one of those yeah. countries. Okay. I had no clue who the guy was, you know, but, um, after he got arrested, I looked at some of his stuff and uh, Andrew Tate is, is sort of this bronze age warped view of masculinity that you will get in response to femininity meaning that he'll he'll arrive at some of the proper destinations albeit from the wrong premise and so you're you're just screwed another way it's the genghis khan view of of manhood yes yeah um but it, it, essentially it is masculine instinct divorced from any divine accountability correct yep and you can get, you're really close at that point to some level of, like, I don't believe toxic masculinity is a thing because I just, just think there's only masculinity and the denial of it is toxic. But 
if you were to infuse masculine instincts without any divine accountability, that is how Aaron is correct. That's how you get throughout history. That's how you get Genghis Khan's. That's how you get it. And your point, Jack, of your generation turning to the, to that voice, and I've mentioned it on the show several times. The first time I watched the documentary about Jordan Peterson on Netflix, and what blew me away was young men waiting for him with tears in their eyes, lines of them. Now, Jordan Peterson's message is nowhere near what Andrew Tate's is in terms of what I'm just discussing. If anything, Jordan Peterson is, is seeking divine truth as we speak right now, holding Bible studies and everything else over at the Daily Wire. Um, Andrew Tate lives a strictly carnal existence. But your point, Jack, that each of them are filling a void, albeit I'm, I'm far less threatened by Jordan Peterson th- uh, filling it than Andrew Tate, but they are each filling a void that has happened in our churches and created by our churches is correct. The reality is, and just take this as, you know, um, a lot of the men in our pulpits are not men that your teenage sons want to grow up and be like. They're just not. And because of that, they find solace in somebody like Andrew Tate. A lot of our churches are not interested in nurturing and grooming men. And the reason why is because they're not interested in action. And that's all, that's primarily what men are interested in is action. Both good and bad. I mean, ladies, the reality is a man is not paying for date after date after date in the hopes that you will keep him celibate. Not happening. I don't care what his belief system is. And whether you've never been married or are married for 30 years, in the end, men are about action. They want action. What are we doing this for? Well, yeah, men are, men are still about that. Before Todd interrupts me, there's just fewer men. <laughs> okay. no. All right. Men are still about action. There's just fewer men. All right. Indeed. Okay. And if you've got a thriving men's ministry for maybe the first Saturday or two that you do the pancake breakfast thing, the guys will just get together and chat, you know, and share their struggles with each other. Maybe one. And if they're really a, a, a deep thinking group of guys, they might do it twice. But the third time they're going to be like, for sure. Uh, what are we doing? I got a lawn to mow. Hey, man, thank you for, I'm, I'm, I got connected to my feelings. I confessed some sin. Great. All right, cool. I got a lawn to mow. I got a kid having Little League games. You know, I've got a wife that wants to go shopping. You know, I'm, I'm going to maybe play nine holes today. So are we doing anything here? You know, right? Mm-hmm. Are we doing anything here? Or are we just getting together to talk over and over and over again? If you, if you nurture men, they will then, men that are nurtured into becoming men and encouraging them to be men will demand as men for action there must be action otherwise what is the point point? and so a lot of our churches don't want to take any action don't want to be in on the action and so they they have left them in behind and that's why i would urge you to find ministries where they actually care about the men because without them we end up with Andrew Tate's. I'm sure Jordan Peterson, as a psychiatrist, did not intend to be seen as a priest or a pastor for young men. And was probably as stunned as everybody else was at the state of the church in discipling young men when they started coming to him. As to your other question... I don't know the answer because I don't, I don't live where you live in Georgia, Jack. So I don't know what assets you have on the ground. Here's what we had in Iowa. We had somebody like me with a massive 50,000 watt statewide blowtorch that could reach nearly every, the only homes I could not reach in our state were in the extreme Northwest cor- corner of the state, which is the most red part of the state anyway. Yet somebody like Bob Vanderplotz, who had uh, who has an amazing ability to to run an organization, to organize, to recruit people, to uh, to run organizations uh, under his guise, to raise money that you need. I mean, and there's others, but we just assembled people from varying skill sets here that were able to combine those skill sets into one 
one movement that kind of pushed this thing in the direction that it went. And it wasn't like we got together one day and kind of master planned it out. We all just started doing our own thing and just kind of got to know each other organically. It wasn't like, you know, there was some smoke filled room and it was just uh, determined, you know, like we weren't the founding fathers with committees of correspondence here. All right. You're doing this, you're doing that. It just, we just kind of got to know each other organically because of shared interest and our interest and in, in gifts started coinciding with one another. So, uh, you know, if you're in any state, I'd be looking at what are the assets that you have and start networking within those assets to work together for change. You want to comment on this? You know, I, we get, you, you get a lot of emails. I even get a lot of emails. You know, what, what should I do? I remember, I can't, you, you it's your backyard you got to look around but remember this remember when hamish asked william wallace hey, wh where are you going and william wallace turns to him and says i'm going to pick a fight go pick a fight it doesn't I, it doesn't have it that can look a lot of different ways but something where there needs to be a winner and a loser and get in that ring and just do it because they're everywhere agreed agreed i mean that's that's the name of the game, and this is what we talk about all of the time. Got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Too many, and look, I like my creature comforts as well. I just installed a couple of speakers and a Bluetooth uh, amplifier out of my deck. Now get to enjoy my deck a little bit more. You know, those things are good. Whatever your pastime is, whatever your smoke them if you got them's are, Everybody likes their creature. And comforts, we all need them. And we all need them. But fundamentally, that cannot be your idol that you polish and go home to every single day. Whatever that is. What is a Calvin? Our hearts are little idol factories. We got a lot of idols that need smashing before we can go smash theirs. Indeed. And when we talk about passivity, I think sometimes that is and often it is mistaken for a temperament like Peter McCullough's temperament and mine are completely different. Mm -hmm. Trust me. I just spent a weekend with yeah, him. That guy picks fights. So. There's nothing passive about Peter no. McCullough. All right. It, it, if you have, it's not a, it, it's not a, it's not a, um, it, it, it's again, it's not a tone. It's not a temperament. It's not a sentiment. It's a mentality. It's a mentality. It's a mentality that leads to inaction in the face of the, of, of, of the, the action that must be taken. That's what it is. And men of varying degrees and tones can become passive because they fail to act. It's about action. More in a moment. Hey, everyone deals with pain from time to time. It's one of the few guarantees we have in life, along with death and taxes. Happy Friday from our friends at Relief Factor. But they're not here to leave you in the lurch. They won't leave you hanging. They're here with a possible antidote for you. It is called Relief Factor, the drug-free, all-natural supplement created by doctors who can prescribe drugs, who noticed that a lot of the chronic pain they were seeing in their practices was because people had too much inflammation in the body. And they want to do something about that. So they did with Relief Factor. And they are so confident that it will work for you that they offer it to you for the first three weeks for just 20 bucks. Why? Because about 70% of the people that get it after three weeks are like, the results I've seen, I'm, I'm sticking with it. And if you want to put them to the test for just 20 bucks, I mean, you've tried everything else, right? And, and maybe you're one of those people, my wife was telling me about somebody who takes Tylenol like every day. That might work, man, but that puts some strain on some of the, uh, the other parts of your body to be taking that daily. What if there was an all-natural answer instead? Let's find out if there is. Go to relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com. Get the trial pack for just 20 bucks. relieffactor.com or call them at 800-4-RELIEF, the number four, 800-4-RELIEF. All right, back to some Feedback Friday. I'll get right to it. Thank you for speaking about the need for church leaders to stand up and bring to light the prominence of abortion in church congregations and the need for healing. Thankfully, I attend a church where our pastor is passionate about equipping our, our congregation to be actively involved in the communities. You'd like him a lot. 
I was in my early 20s when I found out that my mother had an abortion in her life before Christ. In 2019, when I saw the movie Unplanned, I knew that I had to do something to be that person that wasn't there for my mom when she was in crisis. So in 2020, God brought me back to him after some brief wandering. And like many people, I had a renewed sense of purpose. I started to volunteer at my local pregnancy center. And after a series of events, I now serve in post-abortion care. Specifically, I serve at our retreats, an all-expense-paid weekend getaway for women who have had abortions to have space to seek deeper healing. That's great. The stories I've heard while serving have been nothing short of horrific. Abortion, in my experience, isn't usually the first stop in a life spiraling to hell. It is part of a much wider web of evil, abuse, assault, addiction, demonic influence, and oppression even. I've seen God's amazing healing power in the lives of the women I have ministered to. I've watched women become completely broken as they tell their stories, but then over the course of the retreat, weep tears of joy as they understand that Jesus not only forgives them, but wants to heal them. It's the most difficult ministry I've been a part of, and it isn't one that people are honestly very excited to talk about at fundraisers. Yet it is here that an intense battle rages, and here where the church can shine the light of hope and love into the darkest corners of a soul that is broken and despairing, just trying to crawl through life with a gaping wound. I will note that 50% of abortions are repeats. And so it is also the most rewarding ministry I've been a part of. According to my mother, I have in some way contributed to her own healing by being involved in this. Please let your audience know that these ministries exist and that we need prayer. I've never experienced the level of literal demonic attacks in any other ministry that I have been a part of. Satan not only wants to destroy the lives of these babies, he also wants to destroy the lives of the mothers, the fathers, and other family members that abortion leaves in its wake. Most CareNet pregnancy centers offer post-abortion Bible studies and counseling, so please let the audience know they can reach out to the organizations if they are seeking help. Again, that's CareNet pregnancy centers. Thank you for sharing about this issue. Lives have been and will continue to be saved because of what you guys are doing on your show. Continue to have the courage to stand in the light during these dark times. That is from Laura. She did exactly what I told uh, that guy just a letter or two ago. What you did is you looked around right in front of you there and you picked a fight. Mm-hmm. Is that you're helping others, but you're helping, you're picking a fight against the dark, just murder of innocence. You're in the ring there. The spiritual darkness is obviously clear. This is what we need to do in, in terms of it being a ministry here. There's all kinds of um, uh, ministries. S- Steve has been uh, on one um, to Haiti, but uh, I'll, our notion of church ministry has very much been about us taking it's almost like the uh, be, be all you can be in the navy like part of the benefit of being part of the navy is not getting to go sightseeing and tour the world like mm-hmm. you there, there are ways you can help i don't say those things all together but look around you here where you live the darkness that is going on in your own backyard in this country it is everywhere this church right now is still delusional that you know we are kind of the the great hope and we're supposed to export what we're not taken seriously across the world in many respects unless we're giving them something you know stuff helping them and people need stuff but right here in our backyard you have the right idea there is a ministry right there right now to heal this land and this people right now i want to speak to uh in light of laura's note i want to i want to speak to two groups of people pastors specifically and men in general for a minute let's start with the pastors if there are any of you in this audience who are not confronting people with with their unrepentant mistakes, heartaches, failures. You are not loving. You are not loving them where they're at. You are leaving them where they're at. Yep. You are leaving them behind. The Lord confronts to cause repentance. The Lord causes repentance to cause restoration. 
you are not converting people who don't truly feel some form of brokenness, grief for the baggage of their own sinfulness and the baggage that other people have, uh, have, you, have used with their sinfulness to impose on them. You are not. That is a lie. And Laura's, Laura's email testifies to this. You know, our audience grows all of the time. And so maybe uh, there are people on our show that have not heard me tell this story before. The, the very first church that Amy and I belonged to, the first few years we belonged there, they did Sanctity of Life Sunday. And then one year we didn't. And I, I knew why. And one of my, as I've said before, one of my guilty pleasures is putting men in positions of authority on the spot by asking them questions I already know the answer to, just to see how they react. So I asked him out to lunch. We, I took the leadership out to lunch at the local deli. And we sat there and just started talking and hanging out. And once I thought the the conversation was, was, was warmed up enough. I, I asked a simple yet difficult question. I said, Hey, I noticed we didn't do sanctity of life Sunday this year. How come all of a sudden got really quiet at the table and the younger pastor looked at the older one, like, you know, you're going to say it or am I? And the older pastor said, well, we just, we just made the decision not to bring it up this year because so many women in our congregation have had abortions and they're We just don't want to bring up all those hurt feelings and make them feel bad. And I pounded with all of my might. I pounded my fist on that table. Most crowded deli in downtown Des Moines, man, the entire place nearly stopped at the sound. And I looked at him and I said, how dare you? How dare you leave those women there suffering like that? The Lord did not come to, to have us bury our sin, but to heal us from it, just as Laura just said. You're denying them that healing. And yes, you know, my mom, Vicki, went a little crazy with the hydrogen peroxide when I was a kid. All right? Whew. Like I... <laughs> I still have a moment. I can remember... I can remember mom. Any wound, any open wound... I still had a moment where the, like a tingle in the back of my neck, remember my muscle memory. Okay. I mean, my mom, I think, I think, I think I had to go to the ER once. Uh, what's wrong? I think my son has OD'd on hydrogen peroxide. Did he drink it? No. I uh, just put that much on him. I mean, my mom was a believer, <laughs> right? But why, why? And why does it hurt? Cause it cleanses the wound. So it doesn't become infected. When Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, salt is two things. One, it's a, in the ancient world, it was one, a preservative. Didn't have refrigeration and things like that to keep food fresh. So one way that you would do that is by salting it. But salt would also be used as a disinfectant to clean wounds. And so when you hear the phrase pouring salt in the wound, that denotes what? Pain or pleasure? Pain. But it's pain with a purpose, Todd, correct? Yes. yes. It's not pain for the sake of pain. Pain with a purpose. Does Jesus know anything at all about pain with a purpose? It's called the cross. Yeah, he knows a thing or two about pain with a purpose. Did the father just put his son up on that wooden beam just to watch him suffer because it was a Friday? No, for a purpose. He suffered for you. Pain with a purpose is good. Provided the purpose is. Yes, the conversations will be painful and awkward at first. But that's how we get to healing later. And the kinds of testimonies that Laura just shared with us. Now to the men in general, let me say this. And you made me think of this when you were talking, Todd. Get into the fight. Have the fight. Get into the fight. For this fight will be had with or without you. And your families and your children and your grandchildren 
will be the stakes that the fight is being had over with or without you. At the very least, let your loved ones find you fighting for them. No guarantee of success. I mean, I I can't sit here and tell you. I can't sit here and tell you that America will be revived. I, I cannot tell you that. I mean, God even allowed his own people, Israel, to fall into evacuation and disbursement, into collapse, because they earned that collapse. So, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I can't sit yeah. here and guarantee that a bit player on the prophetic stage like the United States of America is guaranteed some kind of perpetual favored nation status in the kingdom of God. But nevertheless, I do know this, though. I, I don't know. I don't know if all of our efforts are too late. That I don't, in, in, terms of, in terms of generating the human outcome that we want. But would God not be glorified if America would be judged and over? Would it not be deserved? Would it not be, and mm-hmm. would it not be in accordance with God's righteous and judgment and holiness for him to judge this nation and say, your time yeah. is up? Of course it would. And when that happens and you have that confused look on your face, like the men I'm thinking of in Carlisle right now, decent men, I like them, but they're of the type there. They're like, but I just got done helping to dig a well in Africa. What'd you do about the porn in your own backyard? And the answer, because I know, is absolutely nothing. Steve is talking about you. Get in the fight. Dig the well right here. Because I don't know what God prophetically has in store for the future of this country. I don't know. And I don't believe any living human does. I do know though, that I do know what self-fulfilling prophecies do. That I know. I don't know prophetically what God has in store for this country. I do know, I do know though, what self-fulfilling prophecies do. And ours suck right So now. even in the, even if you are the, we are the terminal generation of this once great country, be found faithful, get in the fight, save as many as you can, take as many of the enemy as you can, be found faithful, get into the fight because the fight is going down whether you're in it or not. And what's being fought over are your homes and your families, ultimately. All right, I don't think I have time to be fair to any other notes. You guys have any final parting thoughts in the final two minutes or so before we get out of here? I just, I I can't help but I mentioned earlier on the show about how what's going on right now, it's the most haunting thing that I take away from Ellie Wiesel's night. I mean, you, you, you go into that book, you know how horrible the end is. But how the the looking around and the scene, the, the rubber band effect that Aaron talked a lot about with COVID, like people just, oh, common sense kicks in sooner or later. Yeah, I know there's rumors about all oh, trains and Holocaust and all that stuff, but come on, it's not really like that. This is good. And it, they just kept believing it had to get better while doing nothing to make it better. That's chilling that that keeps increasingly going through my mind. The evil's not going to stop itself, no, guys. no. It's not going to stop itself, Aaron. Nope. Did you see Todd's camera shaking there? They're literally right on the other side of the wall that that is. They're just like banging on the wall. I would like to go and yell at those guys right now. We're almost done. We're almost done, though. Pick a fight. Know what your mission is. Know what your mission is. God has given each one of us a mission in life. And then stick to it. Do not conflate love for affect or niceness. Do not mistake confrontation with yelling loudly, necessarily. Sometimes it takes that. Do not conflate any of these lies that especially the church has uh, believed and sometimes even propagated about what true love looks like. 
yes, your very existence in this day and age where demonic influence is rife in everywhere you look. Yes, your very existence is a confrontation. But it's not the only confrontation that she should have. Todd said, dig the well right here. Yeah. We can do any number of things that are good. But are we doing the best thing? The best thing is taking care of, first, the idols in your own life, whatever those comforts are that we have and that we enjoy. And then going out in your own neighborhoods, own communities, and smashing idols out there. That's, what's, that's what it's going to take. Get comfortable getting uncomfortable. Enjoy the weekend, but earn that enjoyment by what you did during the week to get in the fight. We will see you again on Monday, noon to 2 Eastern, right after Glenn Beck, right here on Blaze TV. Until then, John 317.